Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I feel I'm somewhat of an anomaly in the uh, mix of uh, speakers today. Uh, I'd like, really like to talk about three subjects, uh, or essentially set up sort of three uh, points of challenge, I think, for the uh, Institute. And they're basically right there, they're right in front of us. It's uh, how does one uh, more deeply get involved in materials, understand materials in a much uh, richer and more exploratory way, uh, both on the molecular level or, a, or on a more granular level, uh, and performance, how one mixes those materials uh, to accommodate some of the uh, necessities uh, that we will all need to address in uh, future building systems, and then most importantly, in a subject that I haven't uh, quite heard discussed today, uh, is really aesthetics. And uh, in our discussions today about sustainability, I think the one thing I would like to try to emphasize uh, is really is where's the humanism? Uh, how, as we build uh, going into the future in obviously denser and denser environments, where do we find a connection to nature? I think this is a key question. How do we always have some way of organizing our day and sort of connecting with sort of the richness or phenomenology of nature, phenomenology of nature in an urban environment? Uh, secondly, uh, how does one treat uh, public resource, public resource, which is daylight? And we uh, very, everybody speaks about using daylight, my building's daylight, all of that. It's very prosaic. Uh, there's a much richer story to daylight uh, as a medium that transfers information that enriches our world. I mean, light is a very powerful medium. It's loaded with information, and it's something we don't actually pay attention to. And I think it's uh, one of the keys in terms of future building is how we do more with light, both informationally as well as for its pragmatic uh, functions. Um, so what I've done today is I've just put together a series of images that are uh, speaking about glass as a material, which is the material I became most deeply involved with uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, and how processes, I think uh, one aspect of working with material is understanding its malleability and its mutability. Glass happens to be one of the most uh, richest materials relative to how one can transform its characteristics chemically and, and compositionally. Uh, and one is a craftsman, I, I think of myself in many ways as being a craftsperson. How do we sort of maintain a level of precision as spoken about last night in craft and use of materials? But when I speak about craft and materials, I'm speaking about craft from the position of understanding your material in all of its possible permutations and then uh, responsibly applying those, that knowledge to uh, utilizing and, uh, and, and, and putting that material to use. So material is uh, one approach here uh, that we'll look at. And uh, I'll just start with a few of these uh, images. And these are... Uh, uh, for me anyway, always a point of reference when I think about a material. These are uh, uh, images of glass. Obviously, it's a material that's produced in many different ways naturally in the environment around us. And uh, you're looking at something which is called a fulgurite here, uh, which is basically a composition of glass created by the discharge of lightning on the surface of the earth. And if you think about this just for a moment, millions of years of lightning strikes hitting the earth millions and millions and millions of different compositions of glass created historically over time that exist within the surface of the earth. Every one of these is different as a glass composition. Um, you think of glass in other ways. Uh, it's also a product of volcanic uh, activity. And uh, in this case, glass is really one of the very first materials used by humans. Uh, and just, just by nature of how it splits, how it behaves uh, practically uh, in terms of fract fractology. And uh, it's a material that has that sort of history to it. And, and for myself, becoming involved in it, it also has this uh, history of production. I mean, how do you work with a material? Uh, and I think this is something for the Institute. I mean, how does one go more deeply into materials and try to understand how to apply it? And uh, the connection to this is, I think, represented by this one project, uh, which is simply a very simple idea, but something which we don't think about. One of the greatest liabilities of glass, in my perspective, is transparency. It's always transparency. Everybody wants to build a glass building. Everybody wants to build a clear glass building. Everybody wants the wall, the spaces, everything to disappear. Glass actually has the potential to actually define space and bring a greater amount of information and understanding of our environment by letting it sort of behave and perform optically. So this is just a very simple principle. 
you see here a window plane, a uh, series of mirrors bring the image of the sky down into the window plane, a series of lenses collect that information and then project the information against a translucent surface. Very simple idea, but the principle is this. In an urban environment where we have no views, you can actually create a view. You can actually create a view. You can collect information, visual information from your surroundings outside of a building, bring them into the space and present them. And it's a very uh, critical thing. I mean, we don't uh, ever think of this, but we can actually build an environment and build a sense of nature surrounding us uh, in a synthetic way. Um, the other component of this, I think, is time. And this is, uh, as we build more densely and urbanistically, uh, we're beginning to lose our sense of light, meaning that our eyes are being constantly inundated with intensities of light that are far in excess of what we would typically experience in nature. And uh, we tend to lose a sensitivity to the levels of information and light. So I think that it's important that we begin to think about slowing things down, slowing down and understanding the phenomenology of light as it exists through a period of time, extended periods of time, and it's much more of a timekeeper uh, to our physical presence, too. I mean, so many things in today's world are accelerating beyond the speed of our physical body. I mean, the physiology is being superseded by technology. Uh, so there needs to be ways of slowing down and allowing this uh, for people to see things. Again, a material that, uh, <coughs> as we're now more aware of, but in 30 years of working with material, uh, uh, incredibly strong opportunities to uh, utilize it optically, structurally, apply it in ways that uh, does not necessarily mean it always has to be a flat sheet of glass. And some of these characteristics of glass, which are uh, certainly much more uh, uh, richer relative to defining uh, aspects of the environment around us, very simply shown in this very small project, which is a glass wall. Uh, the glass is basically all put into compression. It's a structural material. One surface is high, as has a heightened level of reflectivity to it, and the opposite surface has a, a diffusion or light scattering characteristic to it. How do wall systems actually take on multiple functions relative to the visual environment around you? Collecting more information, diffusing more information, what goes on around you? Uh, we need to figure out a way to uh, enrich uh, this environment. It's just becoming so dense uh, that we lose that that, that sense of timing around us. So uh, again, just a way of how do structures begin to uh, encompass and incorporate multiple levels of function in a building, but still remain uh, aesthetically, just very simple, very beautiful uh, components of the world around us that uh, uh, reconnect us to, uh, to nature. In this case, uh, an element that actually distributes daylight. This is a particular type of glass distributing daylight through a, a federal courthouse building simultaneously distributes artificial light. It also has all of the uh, sprinkler systems and things incorporated into it. But how do we get that multifunctionality brought into, uh, into projects? And uh, when we think about uh, light and our experience in space, I mean, this is a, a very, very old project, uh, but it's really this idea in, in this instance of how, how can you use light as a way of enriching one's a uh, sense of a particular ecology or environment. So this is obviously uh, a small bridge uh, that crosses. This is, a, this is the bridge in section, a glass platform bridge. Uh, it floats over a river uh, in such a way that you need to get onto the glass platform, move across the glass platform, then move to the other shore. Uh, but the bridge is basically sort of capturing qualities of light from the surface of the river. Uh, and the environment around it. So the structure you walk on is basically embedded with this surrounding information and it allows you to sort of read the environment uh, in a much richer way. Uh, I've just juxtaposed these. I think these are just, we've, we forget, you know, what, we forget these processes. There's so many processes that have been uh, done for production of steel or ceramics or glass uh, historically that have been dismissed simply because we think we're doing things better today, and that's absolutely not the truth. Uh, we rely today on float glass, uh, drawn material glasses, uh, but the quality of glass that was produced, you know, 50 or almost 100 years ago is a thousand, thousand times better than the glass we have today. So there's always this whole thing of reassessing the history of manufacturing of the material to uh, find out how these processes can, can be reinvented or reutilized, and uh, many of these processes uh, 
similar to this one and the and one I showed just a moment ago, uh, re find themselves being rediscovered, uh, meaning that a process that I even worked on like 30 years ago at Corning Glass Works, where I, I continue to work, uh, is today the same, the same process that's used for this Gorilla Glass that's used in all the computers. Uh, these manufacturing processes always have a way of resurfacing. So going uh, forward in this, uh, other part of the discussion in terms of light and daylight in the public realm. Uh, the big issue to my mind is, and we, we haven't discussed it, is as soon as you build something, you've consumed a public resource. I'm not talking about just energy uh, and sustainability issues, but as soon as you build a building, you've consumed the public resource, which is light. And uh, buildings oftentimes don't acknowledge the fact that you are privatizing that public resource uh, by building the building. Uh, but you're not necessarily giving back to the public uh, the quality of light or the richness of that sort of environment that existed there previously. And I'm just using an example here of a building. This is uh, Seven World Trade Center in New York. Uh, but a building that actually is built into the systems of the building, uh, optical devices that in fact sort of take daylight that hits the building, reprojects light, brings light into the building in many different ways. This is not... Uh, what one would call daylighting in a conventional sense. The building obviously functions on that level where you're bringing in daylight uh, for the be betterment of the uh, work environment. But this is really a way of how a building sort of takes on qualities of light that are happening in the sky plane around us, but we tend to not ignore, or we tend to ignore them. Uh, so here the building actually takes on a much more responsive characteristic. This is a daylighting system that's built into the building. It picks up light uh, many, many different ways throughout the day. And it, in some ways, represents how we see light in nature. I mean, if we think about how we see light in nature, we're typically seeing many, many, many surfaces over a great depth of field, each having a different quality of light to it. So our eye has a great sort of perception of depth uh, in terms of uh, sort of coalescing all those levels of light. And today, we tend to refer to just the screen. I mean, we're sort of flattening our sense of perception of light into a two-dimensional world rather than a three-dimensional world. So these types of buildings can be ones that sort of represent light in a way that uh, one might not expect to see in the city. You're not introducing anything other than qualities of light that exist there, but you've changed them and represented them in a way. So I think it's a key to how we think about buildings and how you bring light to the street and activate that street with qualities of light that are unique to its particular environment. Um, the other part of a challenge here is uh, uh, this is a project uh, that just opens uh, this week in uh, New York, uh, but it's actually a device over the public uh, subway system. It's a new transit center in New York, and uh, the interest here from our point of view and also with, with the architects involved uh, was how in a large new public space, new public transit center, how do you uh, re-engage people on a daily basis with the qualities of light uh, around you and make that moment of time for them exceptional. So the, uh, the piece here uh, is sort of seeing how it's constructed, how the light comes in, but most importantly is uh, what happens here. Uh, the whole idea here is how you bring, this is, this is an optics uh, sort of uh, problem, uh, how one actually brings the image of the sky into the building. So what you're actually seeing here is how the image of the sky outside the building has been folded into the building. So when you're in the building, the sky is in the space with you. It's how you've actually sort of brought it into the building. And I think there are many ways of how uh, this principle could be used in terms of activating spaces in very, very dense, uh, dense spaces and dense environments, okay? Uh, so I think that, the, again, just to reiterate some of the challenges I see, is that it's sort of how does one investigate these materials in a much, much denser way? Uh, how do we think about daylight in a different manner? I mean, how do we unlock qualities uh, that produce a much richer environment around us than simply thinking about daylight as a one-for-one a, a -one trade-off with electrical energy? And then most importantly, what's happening here, how you sort of bring about an acknowledgement of qualities of nature, which we don't think of in an ur urban environment. How do you actually bring something into the environment uh, and reconnect people with it in a very, very uh, unique way? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>